Have you ever had an overwhelming craving for something? Mining the Word, staying true to Scripture while applying it to my everyday life. Uncle Arthur tells a story about a young boy, I'm going to call him Jack, and he really wanted a cookie out of the cookie jar, and his mother had told him no cookies until it's time to eat the regular meal. Then you can have a cookie. So he came tiptoeing in toward where the cookie jar was, but there was a picture of Jesus. Now maybe you've seen a picture before where the person looks straight into the camera when the picture is taken. And this picture of Jesus was painted in that kind of way. And when the eyes look straight ahead at the person viewing the picture, it has a strange effect that no matter what angle you go to and view this picture, it seems like that person's looking at you. So as Jack came to reach for a cookie, there he saw what looked like Jesus looking at him. So he came sneaking in from the right, and there was Jesus looking at him, and he came sneaking from the left, and there was Jesus looking at him, and he came sneaking up from below the counter, just coming, sneaking up and then peeking over, and there was Jesus looking at him no matter where he came from. And finally, when his mother came home, there was the picture of Jesus with the eyes cut out with a knife, and she realized that picture by the cookie jar. Yes, sure enough, there were crumbs on Jack's mouth, and she could realize what he had done, and he was in trouble, and he wondered, how could mom know? There's something about temptation that has a strong pull, and we get caught between morals and incentives. And behavioral economics will often look at the realm of incentives because morals are how we should live and economics are, are how we actually do live. But that's another story. Before we jump into our passage for today, let's pause to pray. Lord God, thank you for sending Jesus as an example to show us the way. Please guide us as we reflect on this challenging piece of his experience. In his name we pray. Amen. Come with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. You notice how Matthew said he was led up. Mark says immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. It was a compelling force. He had to go there. And what was the purpose? To be tempted by the devil. This was a necessary next step for Jesus. Life wasn't going to be easy. He had to struggle with the same kinds of things we do. And sometimes we think, no, nah, nearly 2,000 years ago it would be quite different. And yes, the details were quite different. But actually there are several layers, several different levels at which these temptations functioned. I want to look at the first basic level. Verse 2, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Fasted. Now, I have not done much with that, and there was a long time I thought I probably shouldn't because I didn't have that much in the way of reserves, although there's more than I'd like to admit. And I discovered from reading and from some experience that the longer you go without food, the hungrier you get to a point. It's strange. You don't just get hungrier and hungrier. It comes in waves, and it's around the times you would normally eat, and the in-between times are not so terrible. But the first two or three days are said to be the most difficult. I don't know, because the longest fast I ever had was 50 hours. So that's just over two days. And I even ended up with this fever that I later discovered was what they call keto fever. And I discovered if I ate, immediately the thing was gone. In a few minutes, the fever was gone. But when you go beyond three days, they say, at least in what I've read, that it gets a bit easier and you don't find yourself so focused on food until... You get down closer to the 40-day mark, and then the hunger comes with a vengeance. And you notice at the end of these 40 days, this hunger came back with intensity. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. So you can imagine the stones were not likely stacked like these, but there were stones all around him, and they would, to some degree, resemble the flat bread that the people ate there. And I've eaten that kind of bread when traveling with my father back in 1987 there in the Middle East. So there's that first temptation to appetite. Turn these stones into bread. You're so hungry, you can do it. 
We find a variety of other ways that we can be tempted by appetite. Yes, it can be about food. It can also be a craving for stuff like money or pornography or excess in almost any realm of stuff that's good. And how did Jesus respond to this intense pushing from the enemy? Verse 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You notice everything came with an it is written, but more than that, we see in this situation under temptation, he's quoting specifically from Moses' writings in Deuteronomy. Chapter 8, verse 2, You shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. Interesting. He was 40 days in the wilderness. They were led 40 years in the wilderness. To humble you and test you, he was led into the wilderness to be tested by the devil to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. That's one thing interesting about Jesus. He used the word of God to help him know, to recognize, look, just like Israel went through testing, you are going through testing. And the Bible actually tells you how to deal with this. God is going to know your heart. For what? Whether you would keep his commandments or not. Yes, I'll keep them. I don't have to buckle. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you to know, and here's the part Jesus quoted word for word, that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So Jesus quoted scripture to help him be strong. It's a way of priming. If I keep putting God's word in the loop, if I include God's word as what I think about when I face temptation or just before I face temptation. It gives me strength at the moment of temptation. Verse 5, Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Throw yourself down from the temple. Did you notice something? The devil left out a few words. It's only three words in Hebrew, eight words in Greek, or seven words in English. And what did he leave out? Well, you have to go back to compare with the actual quotation. Psalm 91, verse 11 in English, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. To keep you in all your ways. Seven words in English left out. He wanted Jesus to think, He will protect you, but don't think about how he will keep you. So the second temptation was a love of display leading to presumption. You just presume on God's protection. There's a difference between faith and presumption. Faith claims the promises of God. Presumption claims them inappropriately for your personal advantage. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Where did that come from? Once again, from Deuteronomy. Chapter 6, verse 16, You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies and his statutes which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, and that you may go in and possess the good land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to cast out all your enemies from before you, as the Lord has spoken. So in that promise, he only quoted part of it as he's telling the devil, look, I'm not supposed to tempt the Lord my God. But in the back of Jesus' mind, he could remember the rest, which is also saying he'll push out the enemy. And the enemy here is not Egypt or Assyria or any of these powers. It's the devil with his temptations. And sure enough, what happens next? Well, actually... There's one more temptation before he gets to the pushing out of the enemy. Matthew 4, verse 8. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. You can imagine him just looking out from this mountain, not as high as in the picture, but he could see so far. But he could see farther than the mountain would normally let you see because the devil's showing him all the kingdoms of the world, apparently in a vision. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And as Luke tells the story, he adds one piece. For this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. The devil claimed it as his. I have authority over all this. I can give it to you. Just bow down 
it's that easy. So this was a love of the world. Don't just do things that are according to God's word. Love the world and whatever it has to offer. But once again, Jesus was strong by going back to scripture. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Away with you. Hupage! You know, it's like, get out of here. So here Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy 6, this time verse 13. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you, etc. It was clear. Only one God, not all these others that your neighbors call God. And so Jesus turned that back against the devil. I'm only supposed to worship God. So what happened next? Matthew 4, 11. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. That reminds us of the piece the devil had actually quoted from Psalm 91. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. It came true. The angels did come, and they kept Jesus from falling for the temptation. They didn't only protect him physically. Now, I mentioned that there are several different levels that we could look at. And we looked at the first level, you know, the basic meaning of these three temptations. But let's go up to a second layer. It's related to salvation. Jesus was tempted in the same way as we are tempted relative to how can I be saved? Matthew 4 verse 3, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. There were those flat stones looking like the flat bread. Now, could Jesus actually make these stones become bread? Of course he could do it. He had the power. So what was wrong with him making stones become bread? If Jesus had used his own power for his own benefit, it would have been inappropriate. He was sent to live as we must live, so he couldn't access his divine power for some human purpose. He had to submit to the Father each day. So this was a temptation we could call salvation by works. Yes, we get faced with the same temptation as the devil tries to have us think of ways to earn our salvation. Somehow we pay the penalty directly or we somehow buy access to God's privileges. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I cannot save myself by my own actions. I need God to bring the salvation. And he brings that salvation through the living word, Jesus, and through the written word, the Bible. So I must have faith in God to do this for me, not trying to save myself by my works. Ah, and that brings the devil to the opposite temptation. Verse 5, Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. This is the other way around. Your actions do not matter. Jump! God will take care of you. So God will save you in spite of your actions. This is faith without works. When we read the little letter from James, he says faith without works is dead. And Jesus knew that. It is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So on the one hand, I can't earn my salvation. On the other hand, I shouldn't just try to ignore any kind of actions. I should return actions of gratitude and seek to live the way that Jesus modeled and that God commanded. Of course, when we're strong in one realm, the devil's got another way to try to get us. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Why did Jesus come to this earth? He came to save us. He was going to live and die and pay the penalty for our sins. So the devil offered Jesus a way to save people without having to suffer and die. Just bow to me, and I will give you these people that you want to save. So what is that like? It isn't salvation by works. It isn't faith without works. This is a completely different thing. In fact, it's saying when you have the right goal in mind, the right end, the right destination, it doesn't matter how you get there. In other words, the end justifies the means. It's interesting to me that these three temptations come to Jesus right there on Calvary, although the second and third temptations are switched, just like Luke's order of telling of Jesus' temptations. 
Matthew 27, 40, they said, If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. That sounds very much like we just read in the first temptation. If you are the Son of God, make these stones into bread. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. There it is. The way we will believe is only if he comes down from the cross. It's just like when the devil said, bow to me and I'll give you these people. They're saying, come down from the cross and we'll give ourselves to you. It's the end justifies the means. Do this a way that God did not plan and you will get what you wanted. The end justifies the means. We get tempted that way too. Verse 43, he trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. He trusted in God, let him deliver him. That's this whole business about faith without works. Don't worry, just let him take care of it all. Just like jump, he'll take care of you, he'll send angels. Faith without works. So those were two levels, looking at the basic temptations, looking uh, layered maybe deeper about how is it related to salvation. And there's another one, how does it relate to God's word? Verse 3, now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God. Wait a minute. What were the last words that were recorded as Jesus hearing from the father when he was baptized? Matthew three seventeen. suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So the word of God said, this is my beloved son. And the devil said, if you are the son of God. So what is that first temptation on a Bible basis? Well, one way to look at it is doubt the word of God. You don't believe it just because it says so. Maybe there's some other reason this was written, or maybe it doesn't really mean what it says, and we need to take a look at it another way. Or it can mean live without reference to the word of God. I can read it for information, but don't actually live this way. Who would live this way today anyway? We are a few thousand years later from when God gave those words to Moses, but Jesus took those words very literally and specifically as they'd been written. So summarizing, that's doubt the word of God, whether you doubt that you should actually live that way or doubt that it even had that meaning. Now the second temptation goes a different direction. Okay, then when the devil had him up on the pinnacle of the temple, notice what he did with God's word. It is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Remember he skipped those words, three words in Hebrew, seven words in English? He skipped those words. He was twisting the Bible to make the Bible say what he wanted it to say. And so often that's what we do. We're looking in the Bible, can I make it say what I need to say so people will do what I want them to do? Maybe they'll give me permission to do something that God actually condemned if I find the right place that looks this other way. So the new direction is to twist or rest the word of God. And Jesus responded, verse 7, It is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Be sure to quote or read scripture the way it's actually written. Don't be twisting it to make it sound like what you want it to sound like. People are very happy to make it bend and move to fit their agendas. And it's easy for that to become part of my action if I'm not careful. I need to follow Jesus' path. Take it as it reads. The third temptation is quite different. The devil took him up on the high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and then said, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Who is the real person with authority over the world? God is the one who has authority over all the world. So the devil was challenging the authority of God. The written word says, God has authority. The devil's spoken word is, I have authority. Just bow to me. I give this to you. And there are so many ways that we do something different than accept the authority of God's word. We might put science over the word or our personal opinion over the word, or we may put the teachings of very significant people over the word and we're reaching here and there when do we ever go to the word of god itself and actually follow it verse 10 jesus said to him away with you satan for it is written you shall worship the lord your god and him only shall you serve i challenge you take time to discover what the bible actually says 
you can know it like Jesus knew it, so that even when someone tried to twist it in front of him, he would remember what it actually said, and he could go to other parts of the Bible to give him guidance, to protect him from the kinds of errors he could otherwise let creep into the experience. So let the Bible actually guide the way you live each day. The Bible will be a source of strength, a source of comfort, a source of protection, and the angels of God will keep you in all your ways. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for guiding us day by day. Help us to truly follow your word as Jesus did and not to let the way of the enemy lead us somewhere else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you as you continue mining the word.